Good evening, everybody. My name is Dave Eldon, and this is my friend Dalton Grimes. What's and up, guys? Tonight, we have got a really special treat for all of you. How special is that treat, Dave? Oh, it's, it's amazing. All um, right. Yeah, so we're, so. we're going to be talking about casting a spell, and it's well, really magical. But David, yeah, do we really need to cast spells? Well, I tend to have more fun in the magic games where I cast spells, so it's a pretty important topic You're to right. Me. I just won't let yours resolve. Oh, I see. Well, now you have priority to uh, talk about some, no, no, no. some spell casting stuff. Okay. <laughs> so this is a really important topic for a lot of judges, and it's one of the kind of most famous things that, that we tend to think about when we think about the topics that are covered on the L1 exam. And the L2 exam also has some, some casting yes. of spell stuff in it. So it's something we do all the time in a game of Magic. Every game of Magic has lots of spells getting cast. And like timing and priority, it's the sort of thing that happens so many times that the process for it is not really thought about a lot because if you had to think about it a lot every time you did it, it would start to get a little pretty quick. Mm -hmm. But the process actually has a, a, a very you know great number of steps to it. And if you actually go through an example where all of these steps actually happen, it, it tends to be a little bit um, well, a little bit more interesting <laughs> than just say, I'll cast a grizzly <coughs> there and it resolves. So, Wouldn't that be a magical game? Boy, All you have to do is say it. Boy, oh boy. So there, there are a lot of grizzly bears in, in my examples, and there, yes. there might be one or two coming up today. So first of all, let's, let's talk about um, the process. There, there are several steps. Uh, mm -hmm. this, is, this is like a broad overview of, of how casting a spell works. So there, there are many steps, and in order to cast a spell, you go through this process, the process is spelled out in the comprehensive rules, mm -hmm. and you go through each step in the process that's applicable, and once you get to the end of the process, the spell is considered a cast. Mm -hmm. And so we'll, we'll just start uh, at the very beginning. So what, what is the first step in that process? Well, the first step of casting a spell is announcing that spell. Yes. So you have to have access to it and the ability to cast it. So for the most part, this is going to mean spells that are in your hand. Yes. Those are going to be the easiest ones that you have access to. But, for example, if you're playing Commander, then you are allowed to cast your Commander from the Command Zone. So it's not in your hand, but you still have access to that spell. That's right. And so in, in other formats, for example, you might have Flashback. Flashback mm -hmm. is a great mechanic that lets you cast spells from another zone, the Graveyard. And you can also have uh, mechanics like Madness, which lets you cast spells from Exile. So usually you're casting spells from your hand, but that's by no means a, a sure thing. Correct. So then our next step for casting a spell is that you have to make choices. Now, for some spells, this isn't applicable. Yeah. For example, I could cast Wrath of God. Destroy all creatures, they can't be regenerated. Well, I really don't have any choices there. Right. Except for how I want to pay that mana. Yeah. So that's that's good. There, there are other spells that are kind of more involved than that. Mm -hmm. We'll definitely get uh, a few examples coming your way that talk about what, what other kind of more complicated spell casting might look like. Mm -hmm. So you, you make the choices for the spell. And what, what, what might be some examples of choices that you might have to make? So some choices we might see um, fatal push. Yeah. What creature am I going to target? Okay. Do I want to target your grizzly bear? Do I want to target your spell skite? So those are examples of one of the most common choices, and that's targeting. We also have cards like um, one of the most common choices, and that's targeting. Oh. We I can't imagine. I'm like completely blanking. There are so many cards in Magic, and I can't even think of choices. Well, or I think rather the problem is the ones I am thinking of are just those completely fringe cards that no one's ever heard of, and I don't know why I'm thinking about them. Oh, I love thinking about those cards. Those are great example cards. So like Sahili's Artistry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we don't an really know what that is. Well, if, if you've never so seen David, it before... Wait, are you going to do something here? Well, Ladies and gentlemen... If you stuck with us last week, we displayed some cards in our hands, some paper cards, but bing! We, we got you, fam. We if you've never you. heard of Sahili's Artistry and you don't have 2020 vision, then you don't have to look at the Sahili's Artistry card that I may or may not own that, you know, we had to use the example for uh, using our imagination for. Here it is exactly. right on screen. 
Uh, so Healy's Artistry is an example of a, a spell that asks you to make a different type of choice, a modal spell. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you, you can choose one. This is a, a special kind of modal spell because you, you can choose both of the modes. That's mm -hmm. not representative. Uh, a lot of the time you can only choose one. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's uh, the way it'll work with when you're casting the Sahili's Artistry, one of the choices you'll have mm -hmm. to make uh, in addition to the targets is you're going to have to choose which mode uh, or modes that you want to activate. So that's, uh, that's another mm -hmm. kind of choice that you can have to make. Uh, David, now they're all coming spell. to me, and I feel bad. Oh yeah, what what is cryptic got? command? Oh boy, that's is a, probably that's a one of the one. most a lot of modes on that ones. spell. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, so hole breach, profane command, so, all the commands. So what, what's what's another kind of a card that uh, that you might have to, or another another type of a choice that you might have to make? Well, here's here's one you can you can blaze it up, mm -hmm. and with with blaze, eighth edition blaze, best blaze. Uh, no, with Blaze here, uh, you, you have a, a special a special letter here, that the X letter, and so you'd have to choose what the value of the X would be. The special letter's not B. Yeah, no, but it's no, capitalized. It's, it's it's in the mana cost and also in the ability. So you have to, right. you have to choose what the what the value of X is. Uh, the other other kind of choices that you might have to make would it would involve some some kind of more um, let's let's say let's, let's say more interesting. I want. Kitchen Finks. Kitchen Finks? Hit me up with some Kitchen Finks, David. So, Kitchen Finks, another modern card you might see. So, if you look at the text on the bottom there, there aren't any choices to be made. Nope. Right? However, what we are looking at for choices is in the top right there, and that is the mana cost of Kitchen Finks. Yeah, exactly. So you would have to decide in the process of casting a spell whether you're going to cast it for one green green, or one white white, or one white green. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's one of the, the choices that you would have to make, too. So that's a good one. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, some of these things we take for granted. For the most part, if I tap a plains, a forest, and another land, David is going to know that I've chosen white, green, and one. Moto is in. Moto! That's another story. But a lot of these things might look like, you know, something that we don't ever have to think about, but it constantly affects our game. So that's that's another thing. Uh, there, there's some other choices too, but this is give you a little sample of, of what mm -hmm. what you expect. So for for now, why don't we talk about um, how how some of these uh, choices actually get made? Because you, you don't get to you don't get to say uh, all the choices in whatever order you want. Uh, that that'd be the most easy way you could possibly think of to to set up the process of casting a spell. But that's not what actually is, right? So so what what actually uh, there, there is an order, and uh, do you know what the, the first choice in that order is? The first choice yes. is modes. Yes, modes is the first one. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confess something to all of you, which is that um, in some circles I'm, I'm you know, thought of as having relatively high rules knowledge. Um, My circle. I, I could not, if you, if you gave me like a pen and a pencil uh, and a piece of paper, I, I could not write down what all the, the different choices you have to make is. It's it's ridiculous. There there are many many different things, and but but I can't tell you what order they come in. Uh, I, I might not know what all of them are, but like if they're relevant, I can tell you which which one comes before which other one. And and so like here's here's why, right? Because a lot of the time, what will happen is it won't make any sense if you choose it in the wrong order. Well, so we can try. Yeah, so so here's an example, right? right. This, this is Abzan Charm. Now, with Abzan Charm, uh, it's, it's a modal spell, so you have to choose a mode. And you also have to choose targets. Okay. But because because of this card, Abzan Charm, you, you can easily see that you have to choose the mode first and then the targets afterwards. Because if you choose the targets first, then you won't know what mode you're working with. So you won't know how many targets you're going to need. And you won't know what kind of targets they're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So this is this is kind of one of those things that that I use when I think about it. Is I, I think about cards like Abzan Charm, where the the wrong order isn't going to make any sense. Mm -hmm. So you're you're forced to think about it in the right order, and, and you don't have to worry about like memorizing an enormous list of different types of stuff. So that I think is is a better way to approach the the learning how to cast a spell mm -hmm. than if you were to just say. You know, oh, here I'm, I'm going to memorize this rule because if, if you look in the CR where, where it actually like talks about this in section 601, oh my goodness, goodness <laughs> me, um, the those are some long rules, some of the longest mm -hmm. rules. The the length of the 
rules that describe all the choices you have to make rivals the length of the rules that talks about like this is all the creature types that are in magic or this is all the cards that were in the homelands expansion <laughs> so some of the longest rules in the game and and it's really a lot to parse so it really doesn't make sense to me at least to, to try and think about all of that all at once. Mm -hmm. uh, rather, you can just think about it logically and have a process for going through it and think about what, what stuff would have to happen earlier or later in the process. Mm -hmm. And if you ever forget this or would like to learn a little bit more about this topic, David is the author of the Judging for the Win blog, yes. which is available online. If you Google Judging FTW or hit up, I believe it is blogs.magicjudges slash FTW. Yeah, we got a link to it. Um, we're going to put one in the Twitch, uh, um, the, the Twitch info bios, and we've got one on YouTube. So you should be able to find it if you're really uh, super motivated then you can find it. You can also look at the, the articles that I've written about some of these topics, and that'll be a good review for you if you didn't quite uh, uh, understand something. We go into a little bit more detail mm -hmm. about how the, the nuts and bolts of that sort of stuff works. Yeah, we'll try to hit on as much as we can, but if you ever want to dive deeper, that's definitely a great resource for you. So the next choice that we have to make is a fun one. In my opinion. Is it? Is it a fun one that might be a little bit closer to your heart, oh, given yeah. where you started in oh, magic? Goodness. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking about? What, what are you talking about? We're talking about splicing. Oh, gosh, yes. Now, at least at this point in magic, in all of the games of, com of Commander Modern I have ever played, I have never seen anyone splice it. Come, comes up from time to time in Grishole Brand uh, is is like the most common way that you can see it mm -hmm. because Grishole Brand randomly plays uh, through the breach and um, uh, the other card that they have, the Goryo's Vengeance. So mm -hmm. it plays both of those, which are able to be spliced onto <laughs> Nourishing Shoal and Desperate Ritual, which which they also uh, happen to randomly play. So there's a lot of uh -huh. random arcade cards in that deck, and it is it is 100% uh, a possible play for you to make. Like, end step, I'm going to Nourishing Shoal, and I'm going to splice <laughs> onto it this uh, yes. Goryo's Vengeance. And that that is a nice one, because even if they counter the Nourishing Shoal, you still have the Goryo's Vengeance, so you can like play that again next turn. It's 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 great. It really is. It's a wonderful mechanic, but it doesn't, you it doesn't have really to... It yeah. doesn't a lot of sense in, in most <laughs> games of Magic. But So at that second point in the Making Choices stage is where you must declare that you would like to splice your card. Yeah, yeah. You can't choose after the spell has resolved to splice. You can't choose before you announce it to splice, as that would make absolutely no sense. Yeah, and, and perhaps more relevant, the, the choice of whether to splice stuff onto it and you know what stuff to splice onto it has to happen before you choose targets, because again, a lot of these splice cards have targets that you would have to choose for them. And it wouldn't make sense to choose your targets and then splice something on, because you, you in that case, would have to choose targets again for whatever thing that you're spliced on. And, and that doesn't really make sense with how magic does things. Exactly. So we've already decided on the modes we're going to use. We have already spliced all applicable cards. So our third choice is the intention to pay alternate or additional costs. Yeah. yeah. Now, this is not the point where we do pay those costs. It is just our choice as That's to whether or not we would like to. Yes. So let's let's talk a little bit about, about costs because costs is a very... Uh, important kind of subtopic in, in mm -hmm. the process of casting a spell. So when you cast a spell, you have to pay mana to do it generally. Now, uh, sometimes sometimes you're, you're running a little low on funds and you, you don't want to pay the mana. So a lot of spells will have an alternate cost. What's, what's your favorite alt cost spell? Oh, favorite alternate cost? Yeah. I like... Um... I don't know, what's a good old example? Let's Aww. say Force of Will. Force of Will. Force, Force of Will is a good one. So with Force of Will, um, OG Force of Will, that is. Ooh. So with, with Force of Will, we have a, a, an alternate cost uh, where you can pay one life and remove a blue card in your hand from the game instead of paying the, the rather extortionate mana cost here. Mm -hmm. So with, with Force of Will, uh, you, you can old school it and, and play it for five, but most of the time you're going to be paying the alternate cost here. Mm -hmm. And so that, that that's an example of, of what something might look like within with an alternate cost. Now, now have you got an idea of, of, of an additional cost that you'd like to say? Additional cost. Let's go for... Mm. Too late. 
we, we came we came in this is one of my favorite cards uh me and me and thalio go way back uh well not not really in, in a lot of decks that i played but this this <laughs> card was one of my favorite cards from the dark ascension set i've gone against her a lot yeah well okay maybe maybe one of my favorite cards might not be the best thing to say because there's there's a lot of people who probably are you know gunning for little thalio here <laughs> but i i am a i'm a big fan of, of this taxing type of a thing so that's that's a you know another example of a card that that gives you the the ability to to pay an additional cost now now not all additional costs are bad no, right now we, we tend to think about additional costs as, as things like this um or, or maybe something like um uh, an altars reap mm -hmm. so with with altars reap here that's not altars reaping okay there maybe is. maybe like this so with, with the altars reap here uh, you have an additional cost where you get to sacrifice a creature and, and draw two cards. There's also some other some other cards, like uh, a maybe less well-known one is this one. Uh, the Rite of Consumption. Wow, that one didn't work. You put right for. Ladies and gentlemen, we are figuring out the system. So enjoy the Abzan Falconer. Yeah, so with, with this one, the, the Rite of Consumption, it doesn't really make sense as a spell unless you pay the alter, uh, the additional cost, mm -hmm. right? With, with this one here, uh, the effect of the spell is based on what the creature that you sacrifice does. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's some stuff that's like pure upside, like uh, the... I'm never gonna get the hang of this. Vines of Vastwood. <laughs> Vines of Vastwood has Kicker. Kicker mm -hmm. is a great mechanic. You get to pay an additional cost, and the additional cost is purely beneficial. beneficial. You don't have to pay it, but if you do, you get an extra upside. Mm -hmm. So this is this is another kind of example of an, an additional cost, and, mm -hmm. and this this is uh, you know it's it's not all Thalia's and uh, Sphere Resistances. There's there's some fun ones in there too. Exactly. So. This is where we would pay kicker costs or all other applicable sources. Well, it's, it's not where, well, we, pay not where we pay them. You're right. Yeah, yeah. This is where we choose whether or not. This is where we, we say to. whether we're going to pay them. And if a card has multi-kicker, this is where we decide how many times we would like to kick that card. Yes. So after that, we're going to go back to Blaze because our next step in casting a spell is to, as far as making choices go, determine the value of X. Now, we do not pay X until we begin to pay the cost of the spell, but we must decide how much we would like to pay. Now, in a lot of games of Magic that I have played, when someone would like to play a card such as Blaze, or Fireball, or Torment of Hailfire, they just go ahead, tap all their lands, and say, I'm going to play Blaze for 8. And everyone knows what they mean. Yeah, yeah. Because, fortunately for us, the rules of magic have been simplified into such a way that we don't need to think about all of these things just to play. It's really helpful when you're judging. It's really helpful to learn new rules interactions. It's really helpful to learn just a little bit more about the game. But for the most part, you're going to be okay if you don't necessarily know that this fourth step of making choices is where you choose the value of x. Yes. All right, so I think I've yelled at that one enough. So let's go on to our next one. And this one might seem a little bit odd, but we mentioned it earlier with Kitchen Finks, and that is determining mana symbols. Yeah, so you, you have to choose, the, this, is the poor, this is the point in the casting a spell where you have to say what uh, non-hybrid equivalents of, of mana symbols. Now with, with stuff like Kitchen Finks, it doesn't make as much sense. But if you have like uh, the advice from the Fey or the ones that have like a, a, a two slash a color, then that could make more of a sense. Uh -huh. And then for this one, these types of spells, it, it really is, is kind of important with, with Metal Misstep here. See, with Metal Misstep, it's a hybrid spell. So you have to announce the non-hybrid equivalent uh, mm -hmm. of what, or not, not hybrid, uh, Phyrexian. You have to announce the non-Phyrexian equivalent of the mana that you're, you're paying. So this is the point in casting this spell mm -hmm. where you'd say, I'm paying two life or I'm paying the, the blue. Correct. David, would you mind pulling up Fire Spout for me? Oh, oh, an, an excellent example of a card. Yes, so this is a card there where it matters which color of mana you cast. And there are more examples of these, but this is the one that most comes to my mind. 
So Fire Spout reads that Fire Spout deals 3 damage to each creature with flying if red was paid, was spent to cast it, and 3 damage to each creature with flying if green was spent to cast it. So if we choose and that we are going to spend, we're going to tap 2 forests and a stomping grounds. So if we would like Fire Spout to only deal 3 damage to each creature with flying, then it is imperative that we tap our stomping grounds for green. However, if we want this to hit both creatures in the air and creatures on the ground for three, then it is necessary that we announce that we are paying red for fire spout. So this is one of those situations where that really does make a difference. Now let me let me ask you something. Is this the point in casting a spell where we make the decision of of which creatures are going to get hit by fire spout? I think so. So First of all, like uh, a little a brief technical thing, we don't actually decide which creatures are going to get hit. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we decide what mana we're going to spend for it, and the mana that we spend for it decides what gets hit. Correct. We um, don't target, so we don't have to choose those yet. Yeah. So another another interesting thing about Fire Spout is the, the damage gets dealt to stuff based on what happened during the casting, but we don't, we don't really lock the choice in until later in the process when we pay the mana. Mm -hmm. So let's say that I was going to play a Fire Spout. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the point in the process where I would say, I'm paying two red for Fire Spout, or I'm paying two green for Fire Spout. Now, at that point, it, your intentions are probably clear what you're going to do, mm -hmm. but it's still perfectly legal, for your example, for you to say that I'm going to pay two and a uh, two and a green for Fire Spout, mm -hmm. and then tap Stomping Grounds for green also, and, you know only in the process of casting it, which are only in the process of paying the cost is, is where that uh, determination is actually made. It's, it's perfectly relevant, for example, to pay green, green, red uh, with the same thing. Mm -hmm. and, and in that case, you can announce that you're paying a green mana for the hybrid symbol and decide to tap Stomping Grounds for red. And even though the red mana from Stomping Grounds isn't spent to cast the green or red part of the mana cost for Fire Spout, mm -hmm. the, the game will still see that you spend a red mana on it, and it'll still deal the three damage to both types of creatures. Correct. So that, that's kind of, a, of an interesting and subtle distinction there, but this is the, the type of distinction that we're here to try and draw. Mm -hmm. uh, getting, getting really deep into the process and having a, a good understanding of exactly what's going on at every single step mm -hmm. of the way. Is there any way we can check our chat to see if anyone has any questions so far yeah i wouldn't it, want to leave you all hanging this this is uh this is kind of one of the the more interesting parts of, of casting a spell so if there's anyone in the chat here who has any questions we invite you to uh to you know type them in now and we'll we'll talk about them there's only a couple of steps left to go in this process isn't there yes there are um so and th these are some shorter and shorter yeah th these are some other really interesting uh types of types of uh topics that that we're going to talk about all right, so we found your Abzan charm. Okay, all right. We have decided that we are going to distribute two plus one plus one counters among one or two target creatures. Yeah. I believe that is the third mode of Abzan charm. It is. There you go. It's the third mode of Abzan charm. So what do we do first, David? Do we distribute or do we target? Right, so of course this is another one of those uh, situations <laughs> where it only makes sense if you do it one way. Mm -hmm. So if you say the targets first, then you know what creatures are gonna be affecting when you distribute them among. Correct. You know what the set of creatures that is, it's possible to distribute them among is. On the other hand, if you say I'm gonna distribute among this creature and this creature, and then you only target this creature, then the game is like, hmm, that doesn't really make sense. And so in the same way, it doesn't really make sense to distribute before you target, you can only really do that after. Exactly. And indeed, the distribution uh, of counters uh, and door damage, those are generally the only two things that you distribute. Mm -hmm. uh, it really is only going to make sense at the very end, and so that's that's where that step is, is going to be. Now, I've got a question for you here. Yes. So, distribute two plus one plus one counters among one or two target creatures. Right. Sure. It yeah. doesn't say creatures I control. So I'm going to cast Abzan Charm. Okay. Abzan, Abzan, whichever you prefer. Um, I'm going to target my Grizzly Bear. Okay. And I'm going to target your Phantasmal Bear. Okay. So Phantasmal Bear has an ability. It says whenever it becomes a target of a spell or ability, sacrifice it. Yes. Right? 
Yes. I don't want to put any plus one plus one counters on your bear. I just want to target it. Yeah. Sure? Sure. So I'm going to put both plus one plus one counters on my grizzly bear. Okay, well... Does that work? Uh, it, it turns out that that actually does not work. There's Why a not? specific rule uh, that says when... I want your bear to die. <laughs> when, when the player is determining uh, a distribution, every target has to have at least one of what's being distributed. Mm -hmm. So with, with that being the case, it's not legal for you to choose a distribution that's zero counters for my bear and two counters for your bear because my bear is a target but it isn't getting at least one of the things that are mm -hmm. getting distributed so so that's the reason why that play actually does not work now there's some similar kind of things uh, and this is where it gets a little bit uh confusing there's some similar types of effects that um work completely the opposite way and what? so yeah right who would have thought well magic is a, a fun <laughs> fun and unique game here yes it is so here's an example of one of those effects that works a different way. This is Fireball. Now you notice what Fireball does. Fireball deals X damage divided evenly, rounded down. So with this, the player doesn't decide how the damage gets distributed, the game does. And so if, if there were a spell like Fireball involved, uh, then, then it would be uh, you know, possible to target my uh, Phantasmal Bear and some other creatures to take damage. Sure. And the Phantasmal Image would not get any of the Fireball damage because the game is deciding how to dis uh, distribute that damage, not the player. All right, so let's just hop into that for a second. Yeah. Let's say that you have both of the creatures now. Okay. I have a couple creatures that I would like to swing at you. Yeah. And I don't want you to have blockers. Um, I have this Fireball in my hand. Okay. So I want to kill your Grizzly Bear. Yeah. And I want to destroy your Phantasmal Bear. Right. So how do I go about casting Fireball to do so? Right, so um, there's a couple more steps uh, in the process and this will segue nicely into those. Mm -hmm. So let's let's go through what we know so far, right? So what, what was our first step would, would be to move the Fireball onto the stack and announce that I'm casting the Fireball, yes. So then the next step after that would be... Splice? Are you splicing <laughs> it? No, I don't think so. There's, there's not any splicing that we can do. The, the, is the there next like arcane adaptation Ooh, for there, there is not um, for sp uh, what? Copy of spells are the only way that you can add the arcane subtype to a spell right now. Bummer. So there's no modes on Fireball. You can tell because it doesn't use the words choose one. That's the the first thing you would have to do, and then uh, after that, there's splicing and uh, an intention to is pay alternate really... or additional costs. Neither of those is really relevant here. The next, the next important thing to do is we have to decide the value of x, right? So we know what we know what x is going to end up being. X is going to need to be like two because we're going to kill. But but David, yeah, you have two different two twos. Yeah, yeah. We, Why we, does it need to be two? Well, we, we have Phantasmal Bear, right? Oh. It was one of them. Okay. So so for those for those of you in the gallery here, Phantasmal Bear has a delightful. Uh, we'll hit you up with that. A delightful phantasmal. Yeah, it has a class. delightful ability that, that makes you sacrifice it when it becomes the target of a spell or ability. So because this sacrifice me ability is going to happen before fireball resolves, we don't need to actually waste any of our mana dealing damage to this thing mm -hmm. because it's not going to be around to take the damage anyway. So that's that's kind of a nice trick. Yep. So here's our fireball. Um, we know we're going to need two damage to kill my grizzly bear and zero damage to kill my phantasmal bear. Sure. And so if you add that up, the, the X is going to need to be 2, right? Mm -hmm. So that is that is the next step taken care of. Um, we don't have any, like, hybrid or, or other but, types of mana symbols. David, what's that, what's that clause at the bottom of Fireball there? Mm -hmm. That's an additional cost. Um, I, I think I may have jumped the gun a little bit here. Did I, did I say... Ladies and gentlemen, yeah, yeah. I just tripped up David <laughs> Elton. Yeah. This is going in my diary. Aww. Aww, with like a little heart around my little really magic too. diary, yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, the the value of X is actually um, chosen after you decide whether you're paying any additional or alternate costs. Mm -hmm. Now, with with Fireball specifically, it costs one more to cast uh, for each target beyond the first. Now, we already said what things we were targeting um, in in the uh, beginning, right? What? No. <laughs> So no. this, this is this is an interesting uh, way that you can remember this. Uh, fireball costs one more to cast for each target beyond the first. So you, what you do in order to make this work is you say how many extra targets you're going to have, and then you have to say what targets it is. So that's the way that makes sense because if you went the other way, you would have to 
pick your targets before you knew how many targets there were going to be. And this is the this is the way that fixes it so that first you figure out how many targets there's going to be because you paid one for each of the extra ones. And then you pick what the targets actually are. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's the uh, another kind of like hint card that you can use. I, I call them hint cards like abs and charm or fireball. <laughs> Um, that you can use to, to decide whether it's going to be uh, more or less, uh, wh what order it's going to be relative. Mm -hmm. Right, so so Fireball costs one more uh, to cast for each target beyond the first. Sure. We know there's there's going to be two targets, so there's going to be one one more to cast. Mm -hmm. So um, that that is going to be a uh, intention to pay an additional cost of, of one mana. Yep. So for those, those of you keeping track at home right now, we have um, the base cost of X red, and we said that we were going to pay one more mm -hmm. to make there be an extra card or make extra target and yep. we said the x is going to be two and then after we made both of those choices then is time when we actually uh, choose the targets so we know that there's going to be two targets and so we're going to say grizzly bear and phantom bear sure yep and then comes the part where we divide or distribute the damage now with fireball we don't have to do this yeah the game makes it easier for us in that regard but also harder, because now we have to divide evenly. Yeah, dividing evenly, rounded down, uh, notoriously led to a lot of math. If you look at some of the uh, older wordings of Fireball, uh, let's just say there was a, a little bit of a little bit of extra text on there that. Um, so, it, lo looking at through the word or through the years, there's lots of different revisions that this wording has been. Um, this is one of my favorite ones, um, the Dark Steel one. This is my my first Fireball that I cast was the Dark Steel one, and, and so uh, I, I believe there were, there at one point was a Y in there also, and that that was kind of fun. Um, a Y? Yeah, yeah. It was this extra. All right. X, X damage, damage to Y, y targets. Creatures. Yeah, yeah. And that makes sense. So, this is the current wording, um, and. In all of the versions of Fireball, the player doesn't have to make any choices when it comes to distributing the damage because the game distributes the damage for you. Uh, mm -hmm. It divides it evenly. So we don't actually make any choices about how the damage is getting distributed here. We're going to wait until the spell actually resolves for that to happen. Yep. And remember, this is why we only have to deal two damage for X. Yes. Because by paying the one to target Phantasmal Bear, Phantasmal Bear's ab ability is going to cause us to sacrifice it. Yes. So that that two damage that we have chosen to deal, that will not have to apply to Phantasmal Bear and will only apply to Grizzly Bears. Correct. So at this point, we are all the way through all the choices. Yes, and we are. And we get to, to enter the, the next real phase of, of casting the spell, which is uh, determining the, the cost to cast the spell. All so right. this is this is um, as we said we we start out with red as as our base and mm -hmm. we have two for the value of x and then we have one for an alt uh, additional cost and if we add all that up the total cost to cast fireball is three and a red correct and so that that is that is kind of one of the more involved uh, examples uh, there, there's a couple couple other exciting ones coming down mm -hmm. in, uh, the pipeline here. Uh, but this this is kind of the the process that it goes through now usually you don't have to go through any real like processes at all It's usually just like okay grizzly bear says it costs one in green cost to cast is one in a green Sure. Uh, we, we talked about before about spells that had alternate costs So in those cases you wouldn't look at the the mana cost You would look at the alternate cost and because you had already declared your intention to pay it uh, in an earlier step, you know that you're supposed to be looking at the alternate cost instead of what the, the mana cost is. Mm -hmm. So that's that's really how it works. You you already know what your base basic cost is going to be. It's it's going to be either the mana cost, uh, or in the case where you said you're paying an alt cost, uh, it's going to be the alternate cost. Mm -hmm. Now now don't I have a question for you? you let's bet. let's say that there's two different alternate costs that you could pay. Um, how do you how do you know what it is? It is it like the sum, or uh, can you choose either one of them? Or so, let's say that you are I don't know cascading. That's a good one. Yeah, everybody loves this mechanic, right? It's great. This is one of the most uh, beloved magic cards in in history that has cascade. Um, this is my favorite modern. Oh wait. Yeah, it, it was one of my favorite modern cards. So we have Bloodbraid Elf. And standard cards. <laughs> Bloodbraid Elf, among many other cards, has the ability Cascade. Uh, its triggered ability, when you play this spell, remove cards from the top of your library 
from the game until you remove a non-land card that costs less. You may pay it without paying its mana cost. So this is the important part there. You may play it, play it without paying its mana cost. That is what we consider to be the alternate cost, essentially, for free. Um, so that is one. Um, I don't know, throw another one. What's, what's another choice we could do for an alternate cost? What could compete with my Cascade? Well, I can tell you uh, a couple of really great options here. Um, this, this is my dog in the fight. No, that's mean. We don't, we don't fight dogs. We this don't fight my, dogs. This is my boxer in the ring. Right. So Human boxer. So, like, one, one of the things I think about is, like, what, what would incentivize me to, to pay in uh, an alternate cost here? Um, and so for, for my money, there, there's not too much better uh, uh, of an alternate cost that you might want to pay than, than this Blazing Shoal here. See, now, the, the exciting part about Blazing Shoal, which is also banned in Modern, uh, is that you have the choice uh, of removing a red card with converted mana cost X from the game instead of paying its mana cost. Okay. And... Uh, this is a really appealing option to me uh, if I was going to cascade into this spell because this way it would do something uh, rather than rather than giving like plus zero plus zero, which is what it would happen if you if you paid zero mana okay. for it. With so Gabriel. let's say that yeah we cascade into it, right? Yeah. yeah. So we're going to cascade for the alternate cost of playing it for free. Yeah. Or playing it for without paying its mana cost. Right. And we hit blazing shawl. Yes. So can we exile that card from our hand? Can we exile that fifteen fifteen Emrakul? Uh, well, no, because to give it's not my red. Creature. So you, oh, usually, you're right. Usually Sorry. you use this with Progenitus. My bad. Is, is how you use can this we one. exile that ten ten Progenitus from our hand to pay this Cascade? Right. And the answer, uh, unfortunately for some, yeah, uh, for not some. so unfortunately for others, is that no, you cannot do this. Yeah. Um, so alternative costs you must choose one or the other. You are not allowed to choose both. Yeah, it's, it's not legal to apply two different alternate costs uh, to a spell. Uh, you have to choose one or the other. Um, paying it without paying its mana cost uh, is an alternate cost, and you're forced to use that specific choice if you're casting with Cascade. Correct. Um, so here, here's another example that, that shows up in Legacy a lot. Um, so with, with Force of Will, for example, our, our old friend, Oh boy! Oh gosh! No, that's Get our new away. friend. Get it away! Okay. That is our new. I'll, I'll give friend. you guys. I'll give you guys a little compromise. We'll compromise <laughs> and we'll put the the master's version on there. We we won't right. go like super OG. So with with force of will, uh, you, you want to cast it for cheaper than its mana cost because that's pretty nice. Because I don't want to pay five to counter that. Yeah, yeah. And, and then for another card uh, that also sees some some legacy play, uh, would be our old friend. The original printing of Snapcaster Mage, pretty decent card. Yeah. So, so, so if if you notice here with with Snapcaster Mage, you're paying the flashback cost of the mm -hmm. the spell that you are targeting with it. So if you use if you use Force of Will as the the card that you target with Snapcaster Mage, uh, what will happen? Will you be able to cast the Force of Will by paying one life and exiling a blue card? And, and the answer to that is, of course... I want to. I, I wish that were how it <laughs> I worked. wish I could. As a legacy player with, with Force of Wills, that, mm -hmm. that's, that would be pretty nice. But no, you can't, and it's for the same reason. Because when you're casting it from your graveyard, you're forced to use the flashback cost. Mm -hmm. And so even though Force of Will has an alternate cost on it, you can't pay the alternate cost of paying mm -hmm. one life and exiling a blue card and well as... pay the, the flashback cost, which is another alternate cost. You have to pick one of them, and only one of those alternate costs is is able to let you cast it from your graveyard, which is where it would be if you targeted it with Snapcaster Mage. Mm -hmm. So that this is a, another kind of example of, of how that type of thing comes into play. Definitely. So that's that is uh, how it works uh, <laughs> with with uh, with determining the cost now there there's some other kinds of, of cost type things too um you you start with the base cost and mm -hmm. we as we said the base cost is the alternate cost or the mana cost yep. uh, whichever is is appropriate now the next step that you have to do is apply any cost adders mm -hmm. so you you already decided that you were going to pay some voluntary additional costs in the same spot yes uh where you were making the choice of um, 
of, of which whether you're paying an alternate cost or not. Mm -hmm. So that's where you would opt into any additional costs that were voluntary. Um, there, there also might be some involuntary ones, and we showed you some examples of those, the, the Thalia, for example. Mm -hmm. And so the, the cost adders is the next thing that you have to consider when you're determining the cost. Exactly. So naturally, after we add cost adders to the equation, we will take cost reducers yes. to the equation. Yes. And it's important we do it in this order uh, because otherwise what would happen is we, we might end up with a situation where we reduce the cost to zero and then we added some cost on and there was still some more cost reduction that we could have applied but we already went down to zero so applying them adders first and then reducers is going to help us by making sure that we get the full value out of any reducing effects uh, that we that we have access to correct because at no point in time can you go below zero yeah, the cost cost can't cost. go below zero there are no negative costs in magic no i can't play my ornithopter and get mana oh gosh that is sweet <laughs> boy that that seems like that would be a really broken deck actually like if, if there are a way to do that like I, i've just got a feeling that somewhere out there there would be a really broken way to, <laughs> to interact with that so we have our cost adders we have our cost reducers and then oh boy do we have a treat then we have then you have one specific card in Magic that, that has its own just its one. own rule and or set of rules, and it is it is our boy Trinisphere, an, another card that I fondly remember from back when I was playing Magic uh, back in Darksteel. Oh um, yes, you, you get to pay three mana for all spells, and this is a cost setting Set. effect, uh, the only one in Magic, and this applies after cost adders and cost reducers have been applied. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you've ever heard the phrase Trinisphere always wins, that's why. It's because it's applied last after uh, all the cost modifiers that, that either add or remove mm -hmm. mana from. Now, now there, there are a couple of ways that Trinisphere cannot win, uh, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that in the next step. For example, you tap it. Uh, yeah, if you if you tap it, that's that's something a lot of people don't don't remember about this specific card is is you you turn the effect off if it's tapped. So that's that's kind of interesting. That used to be a thing. Yeah, it's it's a throwback to the OG days, uh, the the continuous artifacts as they were once called. Do you remember back when uh, Tiny Leaders was a thing? No. There for like a hot minute. No. Turn one, Dark Ritual Trinosphere <sighs> led to great games. Oh, I see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So all right. That is uh, determining the total cost to cast something. So after you determine the total cost to cast something, it's locked in, right? You can't change it even if, if it should change. And so here's, here's an example uh, that, that maybe, you've ever, maybe, maybe you've seen or heard of before. This is our, our friend Frogmite has affinity for artifacts. So our only, our only thing that we have is a Black Lotus. Um, you know, the, the artifact that lets you sacrifice it. And Black Lotus adds three mana of, of any color. It's a decent card. Yeah, I, I you know, never played okay. one personally, but uh, I, I, it, I'm told that, that if, you, if you have a Black Lotus, you can cast a Frogmite with it. Now, now but, can you explain to me how that would work? But David, yeah, Black Lotus only adds three mana, right? right? Yeah. But Frogmite costs four. That's right. That's right. Okay. So I think we have to break How does this down. work? It's a trick. It's a tricky trick. Uh, and, and it is actually a trick because there's a way to do it wrong. And if you do it wrong, it doesn't work. Uh, okay. So so how, how does the tricky trick work? So let's announce that we're going to cast Frogmite. Yes. We'll put it on the stack. Yes. So we're going to look through our steps here. Uh, spoiler alert. None of them matter up until the, the cost declaring. Absolutely none of them matter. Frogmite doesn't have there's, any choices. There's no choices. Frogmite there's doesn't no division, bite, splice. No Frogmite targeting. doesn't target. Yeah. So we're going to skip down to determining the cost. Right. So how so, much does Frogmite cost to cast? Well, we start with the base cost, which is four. four right? Yeah. yeah. So let's say that we don't have any sphere of resistance on the field or yeah. anything like that. Yeah. We just have, this is turn zero, yeah, turn, or turn one now. Turn, turn one, black So goes. we have, we are going to move to cost reducers. Yes. So affinity is considered to be a cost reducer. Yes. If you read the reminder text on this exact frogmite, it says the spell costs one less to cast for each artifact you control. Yes. We control one artifact. a black lotus. Yes. Boy, do I wish I controlled a black lotus more often. Yeah. So we'll play some cube. It's really good in cube, too. Yes. So 
our cost is going to go from four to three. Yes. Now that we have affinity for that one artifact. Yes. No transfer out. It's three already, even if we did have a transfer out. Yeah. So then we can move on to the final step. Of casting a spell. Of casting a spell. And that is paying Pay for, for it. the cost. So when you are at this point in a spell, I mean during the process really, okay. you cannot activate abilities that are not mana abilities. Yes. No one gets priority during the casting of a spell. And don't confuse this with no one gets priority when a spell is cast. I mean during the process of announcing to paying, no player gets priority. Yes. And this is the reason why we have to have a special rule that says mana abilities are special mm -hmm. and you can activate those without having priority. It's because of exactly this. You can activate mana abilities during the process of casting a spell when nobody has priority mm -hmm. and the mana abilities uh, will, will be able to function normally and, and give you the mana. Yes. So our cost has been set at three. Yes. We can now activate Black Lotus. Yes. Tap it, sacrifice it for three mana. So now we do not have that artifact anymore. Yes. But our cost has been set at three. Yeah, no take backsies is the, the <laughs> No take these backsies is the official ruling. Yeah. So after the cost is determined, anything that would change the cost after that point, it doesn't because the cost gets locked in. So even though you don't have any artifacts anymore, an affinity isn't going to want to make it cheaper anymore, it's too late to take it back. We already said it costed three, so even after we sacrifice the Black Lotus, it still costs three to cast, and so we can use it three mana from Black Lotus to, to get like the most super value out of Black Lotus that it's possible to get by playing a 2-2 a two -two on turn one. Mm -hmm. Magic just the way it was intended to be played. All right, so David, I've got a problem. Okay, what's, what's our problem? You have a Black Lotus. Well, I don't, but... Well, well theoretically, you don't have donate a Black it, Lotus, Donate right? in the Twitch chat if you want to see Dave have a Black Lotus. So theoretically, hypothetically, you have this Black Lotus, yeah. and you cast a Frogmite. Okay. That's my problem. Oh. That's the best thing you could cast? Yeah, I mean, maybe this is why I don't actually have a Black Lotus. Cause, All right. You know, that's the most <laughs> you would value. misuse it. That's the most value I could think of possibly getting out of one. All right, and so what David mentioned earlier is this is something you can mess up. Yeah. So a so lot of how, times how in Magic, you when you're playing, we'll go ahead and we'll just tap our lands. We'll say we have this much mana and we'll cast our spell. So that, in some situations, works. Yeah. I can tap my land, say I have red floating, yep. and then announce Lightning Bolt. Yep. That's, that's, that's fine. Usually that works out. I okay. can tap my island, announce that I have blue, and I can say I'm going to cast Opt. Yeah. Yeah. That works too. However... In this situation, if I have my Black Lotus out, I tap it and sacrifice it to add three, and then I say I'm playing Frogmite? Then you don't have any artifacts when the game is trying to decide how much it's supposed to cost. Exactly. So That's I would. No so if that was the case, I would have three floating mana, Frogmite would cost four, and I just wasted a Black Lotus. Yeah. Now, to be fair, in a real tournament, um, it would be very easy to rule uh, out of order sequencing unless they were like explicit about them doing it the wrong way. Uh, then, then it would be a little harder to do that. Mm -hmm. But in a normal tournament environment, I would probably um, rule out of order sequencing in this case as long as the player knew that this was a legal thing that they should be able to do. Mm -hmm. So, okay, here's a here's another. This is one of my favorite uh, examples. Uh, of how this works. So let's let's say uh, we have this card, City of Brass, and this is this is why uh, City of Brass. This is why City of Brass is a sweet card. Let's say I'm at one life and you're at one life, and I'm I have City life. of Brass is my only red producing land, and I have a Lightning Bolt. So can I win? Can I win the game um, by playing the Lightning Bolt and killing you before the the one damage from City of Brass hits me? Oh no! Right, right. So, so this is this is an interesting kind of a tricky trick. And again, there there's a way to get it wrong. And, and paradoxically, the way to get it wrong is is actually uh, to do the same thing that we did before, mm -hmm. right? So if we use City of Brass in the process of casting Lightning Bolt, then the triggered ability is going to trigger, and it's go going to go on the stack on top of Lightning Bolt, and it's going to resolve first, and I'm going to die. But if I Tap City of Brass for a red, then the triggered ability is going to trigger, 
and I can respond to that trigger by using the red to cast Lightning Bolt, and then Lightning Bolt is going to resolve first, and you die. Mm -hmm. So this is this, this is, is one kind way of the opposite. Yeah. So so this this is you know you, you can't just be brain dead here, people. You have to you have to like think about which which sequence you want to make in, in this case. You, you can do it in the wrong order, and the right order isn't always the same thing. Let me just say that this is a matter of timing and priority. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, so if you missed our twitch stream from last week it is available on youtube again we'll have a link for that in the also at simply judging ftw yeah at youtube yeah you search for judging for the win uh, okay. on youtube and then you can find our video and all subsequent videos um, exactly if you, missed, if you didn't see this broadcast and you're watching it on youtube right now then you probably already hey know that, so <laughs> awesome so david I think we've finally cast a spell. Yeah, we, we've gone all the way through all the steps, and it was exciting. It was fun. <laughs> it uh, took it, us fifty minutes. It took us a long we time. We did it. So let, let's open this up to the Twitch chat. We're gonna we're gonna see if anybody has any uh, questions that they'd like to to ask us, and we will respond to those questions on stream. And if you don't, then well, let's just say there might be one or two. Uh, you know, questions that I already prepared uh, ahead of time in case that we needed to, to come up with some, mm -hmm. some sweet stuff. So let's go ahead. Anybody who has any, any questions, go ahead and type them in right now. Uh, we had one question earlier. Can you use Abzan Charm to kill Phantasmal Bear, right? And the answer to that is yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Phantasmal Bear uh, is a creature that you can target with the, um, not the first mode uh, mm -hmm. of Abzan Charm. The first mode of Abzan Charm is not a thing that you can do because it doesn't have three tower. Mm -hmm. But if you were to use the third mode of Abzan Charm to distribute two plus one plus one counters among one or two target creatures, there's no reason at all why you can't just uh, target the Phantasmal Bear with with the as one of the two targets. And in fact, you can even give one of your creatures a plus one plus one counter in the in the bargain too correct and now this does bring up something important about casting a spell yes so if i cast abzan charm yes and i target both plus one plus one counters on our friend's phantasmal bear right well that phantasmal bear's triggered ability is going to go on the stack above our abzan charm yes so when it resolves the phantasmal bear is going to be sacrificed correct yes so now our abzan charm has no more legal targets right so does it resolve uh, did we it, cast the spell yeah we, we cast the spell but <coughs> when it goes to resolve all its targets will be illegal so it won't be <coughs> resolved it'll be countered by the game rules mm -hmm. and this is relevant in certain scenarios would you pull up electrolyze for me yeah so electrolyze is a card that says that you can divide two damage among any one or two target creatures and or players, then draw a card. Right. So the C's play in modern, yeah. definitely yeah. a few other decks. Um, so if I use both damage to target Phantasm Phantasm Bear. Bear. Yeah, that's not a good play. Don't it's not that. a good play. Don't do that. So you don't get to draw a card because it's countered. Mm -hmm. That Electrolyze is going to target the Phantasmal Bear, but unfortunately, the Phantasmal Bear will be sacrificed, and you will not get to draw your card. Exactly. If you still want to get Phantasmal Bear out of the way, you have to ensure that at least one of your targets is still legal by the time the spell resolves. Yeah. So what this means is you could do one damage to the bear, one damage to your opponent. If they have Hexproof for whatever reason, you could do one damage to the bear and one damage to yourself if you really want to draw a card, but you, or even one damage to your own creature. But you must make sure that it at least has one legal target, or else the entire spell, or spell, entire spell and all of its abilities there on out will no longer um, cast, or Nothing will no will longer happen. resolve. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times it's referred to as fizzling. Um, that used to be a, a supported term in the rules, but it isn't anymore, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they stopped calling that fizzling. So here's another kind of uh, relevant uh, interaction here. This is like, let's go back to Abzan Charm. So I'm, I'm going to use the, the third mode to put one plus one plus one counter on each of two of my creatures. Sounds great. Right, but but you have this spell oh. sky, the, the enemy of fun here. Uh, you want to try and fix it so that I don't get any plus one plus one counters. Yeah, uh, I don't with, want with that. your spell sky. So can you do that? Can you fix it so that spell sky gets both of the plus one plus one counters uh, for for Abzan Charm in this case? Hmm. 
So spell skite, as you can see, says change a target of target spell or ability to spell skite. Yeah. You can pay that for either two life or blue mana. Yeah. Um, just similar to casting a spell, you must determine costs. Um, so Abzan Charm, the mode he has chosen, you said you were choosing two creatures? That's correct. right. So his spell has two targets. Yes. So do I need to activate spell skite twice? Do I have to choose one ability for one target and then one ability for the other? Yeah. Or if I change one target, do I get both from the spell? So I actually don't know. This is great. This is absolutely great. So if you read spell skite, it'll say uh, you change a target of target spell or ability to spell skite. So at first blush, it looks like you might be able to activate the ability twice and change both of the targets from Abzan Charm uh, away from my creatures to your spell skate. But mm -hmm. unfortunately, that does not work. Uh, the reason for that is because for each instance of the word target uh, on a spell, and with, with Abzan Charm's third mode, uh, mm -hmm. you can see that they only use the word target once. And so because of that, um, you can only target spell skate one time. With, with the third mode. Mm -hmm. So you can change one of those two targets to Spell Skite, but you can't change them both there because you can only target Spell Skite once for each instance of the word target on Abzan mm -hmm. Charm. So if Abzan Charm read, you can distribute two plus one plus one counters among one target creature and or another target creature. Mm. If it said target twice, would we be able to do it twice? If, if you said, if it, if it said something That'd be like, a weird way for it to read. Yeah, the, the, the more conventional way for them to, to word that, and there are some spells that are worded this way, mm -hmm. is put a plus one plus one counter on target creature, put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. So there, it splits it up into two different instances of putting a plus one plus one counter on target creature, and it uses the word target two times. Mm -hmm. So in that case, you would be able to do that trick. Which might seem odd if you're just reading the card as a casual player. You might say, well, why does Yeah, that's why, why they kind of don't use a lot of that type of wording. Even though like for gameplay standards, it, it tends to work a little bit better uh, for, for making stuff work intuitively. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, that's another interesting thing. And um, I think that Spell Sky is a really exciting card. Uh, that might might be seeing more from yes. from my friend the Skydy uh, in future in future episodes. <laughs> but uh, that that's a, an, another important thing to bear in mind is that you can only target something one time. Uh, that's why heroic they could they could have heroic in the same block as um, multi kicker. Oh oh, I'm sorry, strive. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it. It made sense because you couldn't use a strive spell and like strive it to target the multi kicker thing a bunch of times because it only used the word target once so you can only target it one time so that is uh, a lot of information uh, it's, it's a big topic and uh, hopefully everybody had fun with it uh, is there any uh, more questions from the chat before we uh, head out while while we're waiting uh, to see if there are any questions why don't we talk a little bit about what we've got going on next week uh, yeah. and by next week, I mean two weeks from now. So. I was going to say, not not what I think you're thinking Come on, of. man. So in two weeks' time, uh, do you have the date readily available? Oh, I yeah. can't think that far Oh, ahead. come on, man. So two weeks today is going to be February, February 8th. 8th. Yeah. So on February 8th, we are going to be going over classes of information. Yes. yes. This is hidden zones, such as your hand, your library. This is going to be free information. Like Such whether I have the city's blessing, whether you have the city's blessing, what your life total is, what the current match record is, um, and things like uh, derived information, yeah, such as abilities of creatures or hey David, yeah. what is that Tarmogoyf? It's a five six. Is it? Well, it, it better be because that's what I said it is. <laughs> So yeah, that's what we're going to be talking about next week. It's going to be uh, a really exciting kind of uh, a synthesis of what different types of information there is and uh, a, a close look at what types of uh, bluffs that you're allowed to make versus mm -hmm. not allowed to make as a player. Yes, so this is going to be very beneficial for both players and judges. Yep. Um, for players, like David mentioned, if you bluff about something, in some cases that's fine. For example, really if he surgical extraction... Oh, don't 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 spoil it. We've got right. we've got a lot of exciting stuff coming up, and so we're going to talk about a lot of exciting stuff next. Yes, week. there are certain things you can and can't do. So if you want to find out some of the fun stuff you can do and some of the stuff you should avoid doing, 
you don't want to miss it, uh, go ahead and follow us on Twitter at JudgingFTW. You can also follow us here on Twitch at JudgingFTW, the same thing. Or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, Judging for the Win, mm -hmm. FTW, and you'll get notifications as we upload those videos to YouTube. Mm -hmm. We hope everybody here had an awesome time today learning about how to cast a spell. It's really magical. I hope that we were able to... Uh spell it out for oh you. Oh my gosh, I knew you were going to use that pun because that's the one that I used when I wrote <laughs> this article up. Um, so it's, a, it's a, a really exciting topic and again, if you have any more uh, questions you can go ahead and tweet them at us or email uh, uh, our Gmail account. Hope everybody had an awesome time and mm -hmm. we will see you in two weeks on February the 8th. See you then. Yep. Bye. Take care everyone.